Okay, so now let me try to finish that example again. Uh, kind of weird thing with my computer. I think it wanted to restart and uh, um, update, and so anyway, it wasn't allowing me to do things I needed to do. So what I was telling you is that you know we found the um, the minimum variance portfolio, but that's not necessarily the optimal portfolio for us. We not might not want just to invest in the in the least risky. And so we were looking at all of the different combinations, and when we add a risk-free asset into the picture, as we did here, there's we could invest in a 5% asset if we wanted to, a risk-free rate of 5%. Uh, what we start to see is that you know we can analyze these different portfolios in terms of their reward that they generate compared to the risk that uh, to which we're exposed. And that's what we're seeing here with the Sharpe ratio. The Sharpe ratio, this first term over here, R, A, that's the return on that portfolio. That's the return of that combination. In the numerator, we have excess return, don't we? That's the risk premium. How much risk premium or premium are we getting over and above the risk-free rate? So that's reward in the numerator, risk in the denominator. And so what I was saying is that this is the slope. These are essentially rise over run. This is the slope of that capital allocation line. So how could we find the portfolio out of all of these portfolios that exist on this curve here from D to E? How could we find the one that has the highest slope? Well, just as we found the minimum variance portfolio earlier using calculus, we could we could uh, set up a function and take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and solve for um, those uh, solve for those weights. All right, not going to do that. It's a little more complicated than what we did last time. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the formula, and for that I'm going to define when you see a capital R subscript D, that is. The um, <laughs> that is the return on asset D in excess of the risk-free rate. So that's essentially the, the risk premium for investing in asset D. When you see the big R with a little, with an E, that's the same thing. That's return on asset E minus the risk-free. This will just save us a little bit of time uh, using the same data that we had used before. Uh, do you remember that the standard deviation of asset D was tw uh, 12? The standard deviation of asset E is 20, and the correlation between D and E is positive 0.3. So the covariance, if you remember that formula, we said the covariance of asset D and E is equal to sigma E and sigma D times the correlation between D and E. So that's going to give us 12 times 20 times 0 0.3 uh, gives us 72. So the covariance between these two assets is 72. All right. So here's our formula. The weight that we're going to put in asset D, and we're this this is going to give us the optimal risky portfolio. We take R D times the variance of E minus the return on E, big E, which is the excess return, minus the covariance of D and E. I'm sorry, times. All that is divided by big R D times the variance of E plus big R E times the variance of D minus big R D plus big R E. Don't you love those technical terms, big R D times the covariance of D and E. All right. 
So let's plug in our numbers. Um, big RD is going to equal um, Uh, let's see what is it is. 8% was the return on asset D and the risk free rate is 3 so that's going to give us 5. The return on asset E was 13 as I recall. I'm sorry hold on a second that's not right. 8 minus 5 gives us 3. 13 minus 5 gives us 8. So the excess return, the risk premium for asset D is 3%. The risk premium for asset E is 8%. And the covariance between these two assets is 72. So we've got 3 times 20 squared minus 8 times 72 divided by 3 times 20 squared plus 8 times 12 squared minus 3 plus 8 times 72. Let's hope this works out for me, shall we? is 400 times 3, so that's 1,200 minus 72 times 8 is 576. We've got 1,200 plus eleven fifty two minus 792. You know if this doesn't work I'm just gonna not publish this recording and you'll never know that it happened. 624 1200 1152 plus 792 minus that's 1560 and I get 40 percent point four zero. So this tells me that if I put 60% of my money in asset D and one minus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, if I put 40% of my money in asset D and one minus 40%, which is 60% in asset E, that's going to give me the best risk and return trade-off. So let's plug it in. Let's see what the return of my portfolio is going to be if I do that. If I put 40% in D, 60% in E, the return on my portfolio is going to be 40% times 8 plus 60% times 13. That's 7.8. 8.10.811 I believe. That gives us an 11% return. The standard deviation of my portfolio, I would have to plug it in and see. 40% squared times 12 squared. 60% squared times 20 squared. Plus 2 times 0.4 times 0.6 times 12 times 20 times my correlation of 0.3. This gives me 23.04. This gives me 144. This gives me 
square root of 201.6 I get 14.198 and so we'll say that is 14.2 percent. This reward to risk will be higher than any of the other ones that are possible. So if we actually did earn our sharp ratio would be 11 percent minus 5 percent divided by the risk of 14.2. 7, 14.2, divide, no, I'm sorry, 6. 14.2 <laughs> divided, I get 0.4225, which is my reward to risk um, measurement. There will not be another combination that will give you a higher value than 0.4225. Right. Let's see here. So, you know, what we were looking at was just for an individual who was looking at two assets, asset D and asset E, and we found, you know, the minimum variance, we found, now we found this optimal risky portfolio, right, and this is just with two assets. Well, where this chapter ends, this, this chapter ends with kind of a, a very brief introduction into uh, Harry Markowitz and uh, portfolio selection where we're not just going to look at um, two individual assets but we're going to look at theoretically the combinations of all risky assets right now you just saw how many possible portfolios we could have with just asset D and asset E right there were tons but what if we had all these other different assets as well what if we started forming every possible, in theory, every possible combination of every possible asset that's out there, right? Every possible risky assets, just as we did with asset uh, D and E, we were able to solve for the return and the risk of each one of those by calculating the return on the portfolio, which is a weighted average, and the standard deviation of each asset, which was not a weighted average right because we had to take into account covariance but I want you to think about the problem now you know with when we had just two assets we had in our formula if you remember part of that formula the last part was 2 times the weight in D times the weight in E times the covariance of D and E right um, that 2 doesn't exist because there was two assets total in the portfolio it exists because you know we were looking at how how asset D varied relative to E and how E varied relative to D what if we had three assets in the portfolio the formula and let's let's let those assets be uh, D and E and F okay well the formula would now be something like this the weight in asset D squared Sigma D squared plus the weight in asset E squared sigma E squared plus the weight in asset F squared sigma F squared plus 2 times how D W D W E covarious covary how does D covary with E plus 2 times how D and F are going to covary plus 2 times how E and F are going to covary. Right? The 2 is because, you know, A varies with B and B varies with A, and it happens to be the same relationship, so there's, there's a 2 there. So with three assets, you can see we're actually going to have a lot more work to do, aren't we? Right? We've got to consider all these different covariances. In fact, we're going to have six of them total. We've got DE, ED, WDF, FD, 
EFFE, if that makes sense. All right, with three assets, we're going to really be looking at six covariances. What if we had four assets? Well, we're going to have 12 covariances, right? What if we had 50 assets? Well, the formula is n times n minus 1 in terms of the total number of covariances that we're going to look at. So that'd be 50 times 49. That's 2450, you know, different, uh, you know, combinations. Of course, we can divide that by 2 because, you know, half of them are, are, are the same as the other half. So really, we've got 1200, what is that? 1225 unique covariances that we would have to consider if we were looking at just 50 assets. Can you imagine how hard that's going to be? Okay. Again, that's just 50 assets. What if we looked at, you know, there are more than, there's a, there's a, um, an index called the Wilshire 5000 that actually has closer to 7,000 stocks in it. My gosh, if there were 7,000 stocks, that is 48.9 million covariances. So you can see this is going to become a really big problem really pretty quickly if we're really truly trying to calculate, and we would need to theoretically calculate each one of these portfolios and how each portfolio is going to move relative how each asset within the portfolio moves relative to every other asset in the portfolio. All right, so that's the bad news. It's a, it's a lot of work and it's impossible to do like this. Uh, the good news is we've got uh, ways to simplify that, right? Uh, and and we're gonna that's really what the subject of chapter eight is. But what I want to show you here is it's the same logic though that we had earlier. That is, we've got all those different combinations. And what I've done in red here, I've identified the portfolios that are the most efficient. These are the ones that have the lowest, uh, at every level of return, the ones that are in red, that are on the red line, offer the lowest level of risk. Okay, so for instance, let's take, um, and, and, and actually starting from here, we call that the minimum variance portfolio when we were looking at the two assets. We still call it the minimum variance portfolio. It's called the global minimum variance portfolio. Out of all of the combinations of all the possible risky assets, the global minimum variance portfolio has the least amount of risk. Okay, And then f as we move on this red frontier, this boundary, those portfolios are the most efficient, aren't they? At any level of risk, if you said, how about this level of risk right here? What's the most efficient portfolio? And I would say, it is that one right there, because that portfolio has the highest rate of return. It's so much better than all these portfolios that lie directly below it, right? Uh, if you weren't that risk tolerant, you wanted this level of risk, I could say, okay, look, here is the best portfolio for you, given this information, because that portfolio offers the highest rate of return, higher than any of the other portfolios that lie directly below it. Okay. Um, so that's the minimum variance. Uh, here's our minimum variance, global minimum variance portfolio, the portfolios that lie on the frontier. Okay, those are called this, this is called the Efficient Frontier, contributions by Harry Markowitz. And just as we saw a moment ago, that is, once you introduce a risk-free rate into the picture, the same logic holds. We can allocate our capital anywhere along these lines, or straight lines, and so really, truly, what we are going to identify is this portfolio big dot in red um, that I've that I've marked here? That's going to be the best portfolio. That's the optimal risky portfolio. I don't care who your client is. I don't care how much risk you want or you risk you have or you, how much how little risk you want. That's the portfolio everyone should invest in because you can still 
have the least amount of risk by investing in a risk-free asset, or you can allocate your money anywhere on that line that connects that optimal portfolio with the risk-free rate. Anywhere on this line, even up above here. You'd have to borrow to get here. These are called leveraged portfolios. These are called lending portfolios. They're called lending portfolios because when you're when you're buying um, a risk-free security, a treasury bill, you're lending money to the government. Okay, so those are lending portfolios, and to the right of that optimal portfolio is the are um, leveraged, where you've borrowed money uh, and you've invested. Right. So anyway, that's going to conclude here. That's where I needed to kind of wanted to finish up here with Chapter 7. There's a lot going on in Chapter 7. Chapter 8, there's going to be a lot going on. Uh, we're going to move on and talk about in Chapters 8 and, and 9. We'll probably spend more a little bit more time in, in Chapter uh, 9 than we will 8. But um, I, I would encourage you to read all three of these chapters at your earliest opportunity. Okay, that's going to do it for Chapter 7.